This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight, I am presenting you with the second part of my conversation with Aaron Daba. And in continuing with his collection of weird stories, we have a bunch of very haunting telegraphy stories. We'll get into a little bit about what that is. And uh, times when insects were actually on trial in a court of law. Yeah, because Aaron collects the best stories. You can find more about Aaron at esoterics.com, and that's E-S-O-T-E-R-X dot com. And the subtitle is, If Monsters Don't Exist, Then Why Are They Out to Get Me? Such an enormous collection of uh, fun articles there, weird stuff that uh, you've probably never heard of before. So, again, this is Aaron Daba. This is part two. And if you are a Patreon, I put up this week the, uh, the extra segment I did with him about uh, ghosts in the courtroom. I can't remember what I think that was the, the demons one. Yeah. I don't know. I know it was interesting. I just don't remember all the details. But, uh, yeah, if you want to become a patron for $3 a month, you'll have access to that, plus uh, a bunch of other stuff. Without any further ado, here we go. Part two. So here's what I got for you. I've got uh, the fact that hell is for radio telegraphers. Uh, I have a traditional ghost story of uh, a creepy railroad tower. I've got uh, mm -hmm. a thing about James Campbell Besley and uh, his discovery of uh, an Amazonian telegraph system. Huh. And uh, there's the story of the... Uh, the occult experiments in uh, quantum entangled snails. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I got to go with the snails. They're all they're all interesting sounding, but I got to go with the snails. <laughs> <laughs> well, as it turns out. Uh, the French occultist uh, Jacques Toussaint Benoit uh, had kind of an uh, unhealthy obsession with snails. Not, not that I know what a healthy obsession with snails looks like. But, uh, <laughs> right. And he also was uh, already dabbling in the occult. Um, so sort of mild fascination with how snails reproduce was probably the least of his problems. A lot of other stuff <laughs> bouncing around in his head. <laughs> But uh, he uh, picked up on a piece of fairly standard occult wisdom, the notion of sympathy, you know, in, 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 mm -hmm. in terms of sympathetic magic. And that, coupled with uh, his uh, somewhat intensive and, in my mind, disturbing observations regarding the uh, mating habits of snails, came up with the, uh, a wacky but uh, philosophically consistent hypothesis. And that's that. Uh, well, a little background, he was a French patriot in the, in the 19th century, and he was looking for a way to uh, improve uh, wartime communications. And uh, okay. he uh, figured he'd happened upon something with snails uh, that would forever after be referred to as the snail telegraph. Uh, and, <laughs> and he called it the... Uh, Pazilolinic sym sympathetic compass, if I'm pronouncing that right, Pazilolinic wow. compass, which was ultimately a failure, but uh, some say it was also a deliberate hoax. But, uh, you know, if you read closely enough, it kind of uh, sounds a little bit like what they're talking about with quantum communication these days. Um, so, the quick and dirty explanation. He had, of course, never heard of quantum entanglement and probably wouldn't care right. if he had. Um, the 1840s, in which time which we was experimenting, uh, kind of sucked in Europe. 
crop failures, food shortages, food riots, uh, revolutions in France, Germany, Italy, and Austria, Hungary. Uh, things were just not looking pretty good. Uh, and peace on earth wasn't looking like a priority. Uh, Britain and France were dominating European politics and Russia and Prussia were making a lot of noise and war seemed imminent. And uh, everybody was worried about uh, passing information around. And, you know, uh, we've come up with lots of ways to do that. Flags, lights, and all sorts of other things were being used in the 1840s to sort of signal long distances. Uh, and people were playing around with electrical signaling. Uh, and so the Scots, uh, Scotsman tried it as early as 1753. But, you know, the, the problem with a lot of the, the sort of physical kinds of signaling is that you need good weather, clear skies, sober guys, at the right. four towers, you know, that kind of stuff, which you're unlikely to get at any given time. And the idea that uh, Benoit came up with uh, was, and he was working with a, a, a French American guy named Biat uh, Chretien, I believe was his name. And I'm again, probably mispronouncing these names and I'm sorry, any French right. speakers out there, I apologize. Um, but they decided that they could come up with a means of telegraphing by snails. And <laughs> they, they you know, and, and not at this, you know, in the 1780s, 1790s, not too far in the distant past from these experiments that these two were doing in the 1850s, they had discovered, you know, Galvani figured out that you could, uh, you know, electrocute a dead toad and its legs would twitch. So, People were talking right. about uh, animal electricity, and it seemed pretty cool. <laughs> and, and so people were looking into it. And, uh, of course, at the same time, you have the sort of revival of a lot of uh, occultism. And, you know, put, put a little uh, animal electricity and occultism together, and what do you get? You get the snail telegraph. And the snail telegraph it was because the, you know... It, they started, actually, there's a precursor to the snail telegraph, and that's the powder of sympathy. Um, that was the 17th ver uh, century version of it. It's where they, uh, uh, your alchemist would put together some weird concoction, and they would uh, apply it to a weapon, and they'd uh, cut a dog. You know, and these guys were obviously not nice. And put the dog <laughs> on the boat. And uh, on a boat, and the boat would go off sailing, and they would then uh, wound the dog, and be able to tell that there was uh, where something was in the world by wounding the dog. <laughs> huh. I mean, which of course is absolutely silly, but you know, yeah, they, they 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 needed to. Uh, to, to solve, they hadn't solved the longitude problem yet. You know, you, you could fix your latitude, but you couldn't fix your longitude very easily. So, you know, you send the wounded dog along board your sailing ship and some reliable individual stays on, on shore and dips a piece of bandage uh, uh, used on the dog to bandage the wound uh, into a solution of the powder. And presumably every time he did that, the dog would yelp and then the ship would know what time it is. And then they'd know what the longitude was because that's how they eventually solved the longitude problem that you, you have to know what time it is. And then you can tell what your what longitude you're at. So not right. at all well and good, except that, you know, they hadn't really thought of snails yet. And uh, <laughs> Benoit decided uh, that uh, the electrical telegraph was working pretty well on dry land. By the time he started experimenting, the optical telegraph was uh, was was okay. They'd even laid some undersea cables connecting France and England, um, but communicating across the ocean was getting to be a real problem. They had to figure out how to do that. And Benoit had the notion that certain species of snail formed a permanent telepathic bond when they mated. And uh, details are a little bit sparse on how he came to that conclusion. Uh, but like I said, he had an unhealthy obsession with snail mating. So it's, uh, obviously he spent a lot of time staring at them. And uh, right. he, what he did is he did a lot of forced mating and poking of snails 
and <laughs> decided that you could you could communicate based on this notion of sympathetic uh, reactions, and that these snails, once they mated, had some sort of what he called the terrestrial galvanic current or animal sympathetic current, and you could derive this new uh, force from that for which you could use to telegraph messages back and forth. And so all I had to do at this point, now they'd come up with this great theory, was build a snail telegraph. And uh, he was, Benoit obviously, you know, was lacking in capital as, you know, he spent most of his time staring at snails. But, uh, <laughs> uh, his uh, partner, Biot uh, Shretin, uh, who was a shadowy figure, nobody really had ever seen this guy, apparently. Uh, and uh, they convinced, uh, Benoit convinced uh, a certain Monsieur uh, Tria uh, to uh, provide a lab space for him so he could prove this. And he experimented for a year without showing any results. And Tria uh, started to get suspicious that maybe the money he was investing in this was not uh, the, the best money he'd ever spent. But Benoit finally offered a demonstration and uh, invited a reporter. Uh, Jules Ali uh, to uh, see what happened and basically what it consisted of was of a complicated uh, set of metallic plates uh, and holes in them with wheels and circular discs and steel axes and of course at the center of all this in a, a solution of sulfate and copper was a living snail and hmm. supposedly the uh, the the snail uh, had a supposedly this apparatus was also set up on the uh, across the the ocean uh, with uh, with Benoit's uh, shadowy compatriot uh, Biot, and uh, he was going to prove that he could send a message from uh, from Paris to the U.S. Uh, through snail. And uh, he spent a lot of time poking the snails and moving back and forth between the snail and, uh, and uh, telling everybody that everything was working just fine. <laughs> but nobody was, uh, uh, nobody was ever able to prove that the uh, snail could communicate messages to the other snail. Um, right. Right. It's a, uh, it's a uh, episode where, uh, you know, you, you mix a little bit of uh, occultism and a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of science and you come up with some very weird ideas until you start thinking <laughs> about what they're talking about now, which is that uh, quantum quantum entanglement of particles that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, spooky communication at a distance, this kind of thing where, you know, right. it flips without any apparent kind of communication. Uh, <laughs> so maybe just maybe he was prefiguring some of this uh, based on. Uh, based on the snails. <laughs> All right. That does explain quantum entangled snails. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Huh. All right. Um, what, what were the other ones there? Oh, uh, how about hell is for radio telegraphers? All right. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so there's, you know, one morning I'm sitting around, I'm uh, reading a, uh, 1902 uh, edition of the Railroad Telegrapher magazine over coffee. You know, I do that kind of thing. And uh, the, uh, the, which happened to be the, that was the, the organ of the, uh, the, the labor union, the order of railroad telegraphers, which uh, was an important union until the, you know, we came up with fancy things like radio and telephones and uh, right. radio, uh, railroad telegraphy went away. Um, the thing about uh, railroad telegraphy is that it often veered into the very creepy and, uh, the, uh, in 1902, George Clark was basically just a, a mild mannered radio telegrapher working out of St. Louis, Missouri, and not really doing anything important and, uh, kind of, kind of bored with his life. And, uh, he found himself lounging about the office, his feet on the desk, you know, probably having a cold beer or something like that. But strangely, he, he 
kept tapping on the table the same thing over and over again with his hand in Morse code. It was CA, CA, CA. Now, I, for the life of me, have not been able to determine what exactly that is. I assume it was a call sign. Um, mm-hmm. The problem is when you start trying to research uh, abbreviations in, uh, in 19th century telegraphy, uh, there's a lot of different <laughs> systems they used. <laughs> I'm sure. It, it gets kind of hard to figure out. So somebody out there who's like a historian of, of, of radio telegraph, uh, railroad telegraphy can probably tell us what, what exactly that is. But uh, as he's tapping this out on the table, uh, involuntarily, he can't stop himself. Uh, he, he keeps noticing, and imagine these radio telegraphers, they, they started to, they were in contact with other radio telegraphers, and they started to recognize patterns in each other's the Morse code, the way that people tapped out their Morse code. Mm-hmm. And at, finally, he tapped out a very clear hello CA. And since that was his call sign, obviously somebody was trying to talk to him. And that's, you know, that's kind of unnerving. And then it started to tap out, hello, CA, I've been calling you for a long time, and then tapped out, ha, ha, ha. And <laughs> George recognized that immediately. That was an, uh, uh, a telegraph operator he knew named Steve Fordham. And he started up a conversation with him. And there's only one real problem with that, and that's that uh, Steve Fordham had been dead for a while. Yeah, I figured. He was uh, apparently, uh, according to uh, reports, cowardly shot to death on the main street of a small town in eastern Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as after his conversation, I, I, he has a short conversation with uh, the, the dead Steve Fordham via Morse. Now, did he know he was dead? Uh, he, he did know he was dead, yes. He, uh, okay. Uh, the last words of Steve Fordham were, uh, give my 73 to my friends, which I did actually track down and was, uh, able to figure out it's, uh, that means give my compliments. Uh, uh, I don't know what the origins of that are. Again, we need a, a, a radio, a railroad telegraph historian to, uh, to hop in at any time and, uh, let us know. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, Mr. Clark has had discovered, you know, again, this is the time of spiritualism and uh, has discovered this uh, version of automatic writing in the form of automatic telegraphy. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and with his newfound power, he decides, guess what? I'm going to try and contact other dead telegraph operators. And so he <laughs> tried lots and lots of long deceased acquaintances that he'd known in the railroad communication business. But, and he could always raise Steve Fordham. But he didn't seem to be able to get anybody else. And he, he was moved from Missouri to New England, and he was, uh, became acquainted with another local telegraph operator named uh, Kitty, a faithful Christian woman, is reported. Uh, <laughs> and upon her death, George tried to contact her and was able to contact her. Uh, she assured him that she was at home and at peace. Now, this presented a very uh, a strange problem for, for George, and that's that of all the many telegraph operators that he was acquainted with, he only seemed to be able to con- connect to two. And the conclusion he drew from that, which not entirely unreasonable conclusion, is that those two radio telegraphers were in heaven and mm. all the others were not. <laughs> well I'll, I'll say this though the fact that he c- wasn't couldn't just contact everyone tells me that whatever was going on was probably at least on his part legitimate you know he wasn't making these extraordinary he was puzzled by the fact that he couldn't contact these other people yeah I, or or uh, or god hates radio telegraph <laughs> and maybe <laughs> I worry about things like that. It's like I'm glad I didn't go into uh, railroad telegraphy. I mean, I, I personally, I, 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 you know, when I told my guidance counselor I wanted to be a rail baron, she was uh, not amused. But <laughs> it was the seventies. <laughs> huh? That's probably the first time she heard that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was I, I ended up a tech guy, and uh, if I was alive in 1902 and was a tech guy, I'd probably be a radio telegrapher. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so what were the other options there? Okay, we've got uh, uh, the amazing Amazonian telegraph just discovered by James uh, Besley, and we've got the uh, creepy ghost story of a bunch of guys in a uh, 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 isolated uh, radio tel- uh, railroad telegraph tower. Let, let's do the Amazonian one first. All right, so James Campbell Besley, which poor guy does not even have a Wikipedia page. Can you believe that? I mean, it's just plain insulting if you're a historical figure. Um, <laughs> I mean, he, he's long dead, or else he'd probably have big self-esteem issues. But uh, right. he, uh, this guy was the, the epitome of the adventurous Victorian gentleman. And he happened to have discovered that there was a rudimentary system of wireless telegraphy that existed in South America's Amazon Valley 2,000 years before uh, Marconi got the Nobel Prize for it in 1909. Hmm. Now, Besley's uh, interesting in himself. I mean, he uh, spent his childhood in South Africa and Australia, returned to England, graduated Oxford, uh, went off to Australia, uh, hit the gold fields in Kalgoorlie, made a lot of money that way, headed off for the Klondike Gold Rush in Alaska, and it's said that he pocketed about a quarter million dollars worth of gold. Um, wow. Then he enlisted in uh, the Kitchener's Flying Scouts in the Boer War, uh, which basically involved carrying military dispatches like across 120 miles of enemy territory. Uh, Man. And then, uh, I mean, it was basically one, uh, a pretty bad dude. You know, he, <laughs> he got around. And then after that, he uh, went to Mexico and uh, set up a silver and copper mining operation and a 50,000 acre cattle ranch. Uh, and this is all while the Mexican Revolution raged around him. And uh, some, sometime in between there, he, he won the 1913 Pacific Coast Polo Open <laughs> in Southern California. Jeez. And so he had enough gold. He had all the polo trophies he could do anything with. And so he decided to hop down to Peru and explore the headwaters of the Amazon in 1913. So after rafting about 4,000 miles of the uh, Amazon River to the Atlantic, he uh, actually he's found, he found three Inca cities that had not been discovered before, cannibalized mer- remains of earlier explorers. He survived malaria vampire bats, snowstorms. Uh, he, uh, he managed to take the first motion pictures of uh, Machu Picchu in 1911. Oh, wow. I mean, this, this is a, a dude who like would make Indiana Jones blush. And like, <laughs> he came back to New York city with a monkey <laughs> named Changa, who he taught to order room service for him at the Waldorf hotel is uh, the rumor. And, uh, they uh, unfortunately all in nine, the in 1913 all the stuff that he brought back the film and the artifacts from his uh, Amazon expedition were stolen. Yeah. and this of course this guy is, was such a such a uh, well such a, a bad uh, 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 such a tough dude. He headed back to Peru in 1914 to reshoot the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. he, did it, he did it all again <laughs> but then he came back uh with a new cargo uh to new york and his ship was rammed and sunk in new york harbor <laughs> 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 and uh he, he managed to save the cargo this time though so you know we it's kind of weird that he's faded into such obscurity that like even wikipedia can't find him now yeah but one of his uh, big accomplishments was that he noticed that everywhere in the amazon his presence was already announced um wherever his party went the the natives already seemed to know he was there and hmm. he, he didn't understand how such rapid communication was happening and when he asked the natives they said well how's this happening they said wireless just like you guys and <laughs> 
<laughs> he, he said, what? <laughs> and they explained to him that they'd had their own form uh, of wireless telegraphy for more than 3,000 years. And that, uh, that they simply, you know, were telling other, tri you know, the next tribe over that he was coming by using their version of wireless. And what their version of wireless, Besley said, was uh, uh, it looked like a crude arrangement suspended between two tree stumps uh, on a horizontal bar. And they would, they would tap on a hollowed tree trunk that bass was slightly off ground and inside had been arranged with strings like a violin. And they said when the instrument was struck with a, a, a rubber hammer, the vibration created a, a, a wave that carried for miles over the hills and that the receivers were the, similar to the transmitter. They would just vibrate according to what was hit. And so understanding the sound system, one tribe could communicate with the other. And I love this because this is like, Here's something we, you know, pat ourselves on the back in 1909 for being so smart to invent. But, you know, with a few uh, hollowed out trees and some jaguar gut strings, you know. <laughs> yeah. They're, uh, they're, they came up with the same thing in the Amazon. And it, it, it almost sounds radar-ish in a sense. Yeah. Because I mean, it's I, bouncing I, back, right? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, it's like it could could could. I don't. I know I couldn't build a wireless telegraph system out of hollowed tree and leopard guts. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm impressed. You know, it's a good idea. <laughs> but there, 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 there is a lot of ancient sound technology in the ancient world. I mean that we don't fully understand today. So I mean that that it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Well, right. so, funny thing is, wow. like ask ask somebody to explain how telegraphy works today, and they can't tell you that either. So it's uh, <laughs> true. Okay, so we had we had one creepy one, right? I have a uh, a very creepy one. Um, this comes from a uh, article I wrote called "I've Been Working on the Creepy Railroad," and <laughs> uh, back uh, back in 1851, uh, railroad companies uh, in the U.S. Uh, started using telegraphy to coordinate the arrival and departure of trains. And the reason for this is because prior to that, uh, the whole U S rail system was single tracked. Um, mm. you had to be really careful dispatching trains, uh, to avoid either, you know, head on collisions between two trains going in opposite directions and back end sure. collisions with trains going in opposite, um, or going in the same. Uh, so they, what they used up until then was a, they, they called it a time interval dispatching system, which is basically send a train out and then wait. <laughs> which you know all right you know and you wait you wait enough time so that you know the other train can get far enough that you're not going to run into the back of it which you know perfectly reasonable except that they kept running into each other and you had lots of train accidents um the obvious solution to this yeah. is, our, is our modern solution the two track uh train system uh with each train going in a different direction on a different track, but that required laying double tracks everywhere. And uh, that costs a lot of money and it doesn't solve the problem of trains headed in the same direction. Right. Uh, uh, the more cost effective solution at that point was uh, to come up with these telegraph stations, which uh, uh, railroad telegraph stations where they could say the train just passed X location and you know and it's currently 9 p.m and you know somebody could mm. tell them well it's uh it just passed us here now so it's safe to let another train go i mean it's a reasonable use of communication technology um and that brings right. us to dale georgia and the great thing about dale georgia is it never actually existed well i mean it it existed it was one building and that one building was a radio telegraph tower. There was nothing else. It was uh, uh, about seven miles south of Savannah on the main line of the Atlantic Coast Railroad. And hmm. uh, Dale, Georgia, Dale, Georgia was a telegraph tower, and the nearest human habitation was a quarter of a mile away. So what you've got is a, a, a little tower uh, next to a railroad track in the middle of a pine forest inhabited by three railroad telegraph operators for three months of the year and otherwise deserted 
because as uh, starting in January, the northern tourists would flock to Florida much as they do now. Um, right. And and it would they would pass through Dale, Georgia, and so for those few months, they would need the telegraph operators because of the high traffic of uh, of trains coming through to avoid collisions. But you know the middle of a lonely pine forest, only three operators there for three months of a year and then it's deserted the rest of the year and nobody nearby i mean that that's just plain recipe for a horror movie right yeah yeah definitely <laughs> so along come the the comes the 1911 season where uh some young telegraph operators uh, a certain uh, their last names were uh, bright davis and clark uh, arrived at the Dale Tower to open for the season. And uh, Dale already had kind of a, a weird reputation among uh, railroad men who passed through the area. There, uh, there was a man who was killed by, the, by, the, by a train near the tower, and his body was laid to rest across the track. And after that, brakemen would report strange noises when they pulled up on the side track there. And... Uh, Sometimes uh, when they tried to pull out from the sidetrack, they'd find their train uncoupled in, in multiple places with no explanation. Uh, mm. most, most of the brakemen on the railroad wouldn't even enter the tower. Um, so we got remote location. We got horrible death. We got history of hauntings, right? All we need is right. a clown. We, you know, we got a B movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> Right, Davidson Clark, you know, basically being a radio telegrapher in 1911 is a pretty good paying job. And so, you know, you're not going to be too daunted by uh, reputations of hauntings and things like that. Um, I mean, we'll put up with a lot these days for a, a living wage. Uh, you know, you can imagine in 1911 what you'd put up with. Um, right. So when they arrived in the tower, noticed it already had somebody there. He was, of course, dead. <laughs> decaying and it was the corpse of an anonymous uh, anonymous hobo who had uh, sought shelter there obviously and from the cold and inconsiderately died without cleaning up and they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they gave him a, a good burial on the other side of the tracks from the tower which you know in the end you know you got two deaths and a graveyard basically sitting across the tracks from the tower and that's yeah <laughs> it's like if you could like list the things not to do if you don't want to encounter angry ghosts you know this would probably be <laughs> high on the list um the, the first things occurred uh they were not terribly scary things that were happening there were like trap doors that were flinging open uh fastenings with you know, they'd fasten the trap doors with nails and an iron bar and it'd still fly open. They'd hear footsteps on the stairs, even though all three of them were in the top of the tower. Um, the raising and lowering of window sashes in the upper tower in full view of the three occupants and, and no one being near the window. And they were pretty mm -hmm. sure that there was some sort of trickster doing something to them. So they, you know, they would do stuff like fasten, securely fasten the, the shades and the doors and, and no precaution whatsoever, you know, seemed to have any effect. Um, and soon uh, they, they reported that various articles began to be levitated about the room in broad daylight. Uh, and then uh, a can of condensed milk lifted itself into the air and, uh, a large dish pan lifted itself and rolled down the stairs out of the tower and under it. And a uh, lantern levitated from the desk. Uh, the, the, a can opener flew wildly about it. I mean, it's a long litany of just weird things happening. Uh, bolts and taps and such things as used in rail, railroad construction. They'd get hurled through the windows of the Dale Tower. And I actually have a picture of the Dale Tower. It's just like sitting in the middle of nowhere. It is a creepy looking thing. Um, <laughs> now, is it is it a tower like like these um, like a wilderness tower is, or you know, where it's like on stilts, or is it a tower tower? It's an actual. It's it's not really even really a tower. It's like a two floor building, just a, a, oh. a small two floor building. Um, probably just enough room for. Uh, uh, a radio telegraph from on, and some beds for the the operators in a kitchen. I mean, it looks like a uh, little tiny townhouse in the middle of nowhere. Hmm. There's nothing around this thing. 
Okay. So, unfortunately, things started to escalate, as they do. <laughs> with, yeah. And uh, the objects were being hurled around the, the tower so consistently that the, the three guys uh, had to often run out of the tower and abandon it before they got hit in the head. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, when, on two occasions, Mr. Bright, uh, one of the guys of the Bright Davis Clark trio, uh, and maybe he was living up to his name, um, walked seven miles to, to, to Savannah and he intended to resign his position because um, he was tired of dealing with what was obviously a poltergeist. Uh, but when, yeah. when he got there, he found he was too embarrassed to admit the reason. So he returned to Dale, Dale, uh, Dale Tower. And uh, yet, uh, Bright, Davis and Clark, uh, they, they figured something had to be done. So this is where, for me, it gets even weirder, is that uh, they start doing some experiments. They would take a pack of ordinary playing cards and toss it from the window in the belief. And part of this was also they, they figured uh, the cards somehow were involved in this. I'm not sure why they came to that conclusion, uh, but they uh, tossed them out the window and they found them in a bag of rice, returned to them. Hmm. Uh, then they, uh, the, they found, they tried it with the case for the cards, and they found that in a canister of coffee with the lid tightly closed. And they then decided to throw the cards out as a fast train whizzed past, hoping that they would be crushed beneath the wheels of the engine, but they found it in a bed a moment later. So, <laughs> I, you know, they're abusing this poor deck of cards, and obviously it had no effect. Um, but they, they, these guys were, you know, obviously they were committed to this job because they decided to try and rid themselves in the tower of, uh, uh, of what they had now assumed to be a poltergeist. And yeah. they, uh, the, it's reported that they uh, set about uh, burning sulfur in inside the tower now i i took a little look into that because that seems like a rather uh, smelly and dangerous kind of thing to do um but I, I, it seems that uh, modern witches say that's the traditional way to exercise negative spirits but uh since mm. sulfur smoke is poisonous uh <laughs> most reasonable people look for something a little uh you look for their spectral countermeasures and something that's a little less uh sulfur content uh uh and, and and it's interesting in joshua cutchin's book on uh paranormal smells sulfur is the most common smell you you will pick up around paranormal encounters oh, yeah. so it's funny that that would always that would also be saying that would banish it yeah well it's interesting because that's why garlic probably is so closely associated uh with uh, uh various you know occult warding kind of stuff because uh it's high in sulfur content Hmm. Yeah, yet not toxic like burning sulfur. So burn garlic, don't burn sulfur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll just smell Fair like, enough. You'll smell like an Italian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> huh. But, All but right. what, what's interesting is that it seemed to work. <laughs> hmm. They uh, after they burn the sulfur in the tower, and I hopefully let it air out for a right. year or two. <laughs> <laughs> it would uh, apparently there were no more reports of poltergeists. All right, a little disappointing, really, that it would you know just stop like that. No, hey, you know, effective tools are always a good thing. Uh, is it? And that place is still standing. Uh, I don't believe the tower is still standing. It might be. I, I mean, the picture I found of it was probably from 18, eh, well, 1920s, 30s. I suspect uh, it's gone by now. It might still be there, though. Some some hmm. savvy person from uh, uh, Savannah might be able to tell us. Interesting. All right. Um, that was the last one from the weird telegraphy, right? Yes, that is, uh, I, I strongly suspect I have one or two other weird telegraphy ones, but I, I, off the top of my head, I'm, uh, <laughs> that's fine. I, I think that that's, those are my best ones. There's a lot of, weird <laughs> um, that, 
a lot of this, uh, the like the radio telegrapher, that magazine I was talking about, weird stuff like that got printed in this just completely random like union magazine. <laughs> mm. Um, so let, let's move on to insects on trial. Okay. Do you want to talk about, uh, insects being, uh, a trial about, uh, insect excommunication or, uh, a deal that was cut with insects over, uh, not eating the grapes. <laughs> let's go with the grapes. Let's go with the grapes. All right. <laughs> the, uh, this one uh, is uh, from about 1545, and it occurred in St. Julian, uh, which is somewhere in the, the Rhone uh, commune, noted for its excellence uh, in its vintages uh, in France. Uh, the complaint is well documented. It was put before an ecclesiastical court chaired by one Francis Bonivar. Um, through a legal representative named Pierre Ducal. And the defendant in the case was a herbivorous species of weevil. So <laughs> it was uh, St. Julian versus weevils was the case. And uh, weevils obviously don't typically seek representation. Uh, right. And uh, I think it's mostly because they don't have pockets and they don't have any resources with which to... Uh, <laughs> fire council but uh, right you know they were pretty fair in these ecclesiastical courts so they assigned uh uh, uh council uh two gentlemen a uh pierre falcon and claude morel to the defense of the weevils okay and, uh the problem was that the weevils had been eating up all the the grapes ruining the the wonderful vineyards of the uh, saint julian area and uh, Bonavard, uh, the prosecutor, uh, considered, or, or rather, Bonavard that wasn't the prosecutor; he was uh, the the chair of the court. Uh, considered the opening arguments and uh, declined to pass sentence uh, at first, uh, and issued a 1546 proclamation. These things are all we have; these things, so we know about them. <laughs> uh, and he recommended, uh, he said, we, you know, we really aren't going to, uh, sue the weevils here. Um, we need recourse <laughs> to public prayer and thought that prosecuting the weevils in as much as that God probably made the weevils too, not solely for the sustenance of rational human beings, but for, you know, insects as well, you know, he right. made for everything, uh, that it would be unbecoming to proceed against, uh, the weevils because they're just doing what weevils do. Right. So he said, it's mm -hmm. more fitting for you guys to go, you know, plead for the mercy of heaven and implore pardon for your sins. You know, judge is basically saying, uh, I don't try weevils. <laughs> um, and he had some pretty specific instructions, what he wanted them to do, which of course involved, uh, uh, unfeigned contrition, repent all sins, live justly and charitably. Uh, oh, and most importantly, pay their tithes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, march in solemn procession around the vineyards, and uh, uh, you know, and at least he say he mandated at least two persons from each Saint Julian household should uh, participate in these exercises. And so uh, Saint Julian went ahead and did all of this, and uh, the the it was reported that the uh, upon successful completion, the uh, the weevils disappeared, hmm. which is great. Except that in 1587, uh, the weevils wound up back before the court. Um, mm. Yeah, and this time they were they they also were afforded representation, and uh, making reference back to the uh, the earlier 1546 decision, this new 1587 case against the weevils uh, pointed out that uh, formerly by uh, and this is a quote from the, uh, the decision, formerly by virtue of defined services and earnest supplications, the scourge and inordinate fury of the aforesaid animals did cease. Now they have resumed their depredations and are doing incalculable injury. <laughs> and uh, mm. 
they were beseeching the court again to uh, proceed with uh, excommunication of the weevils and uh, and to uh, <laughs> demand that they uh, they stop their depredations on the wine crops of St. Julian. And, you know, the St. Julian people felt they'd been reasonably charitable, church-going, you know, folks for the 30 years since the last uh, lawsuit. And uh, they, they felt that the uh, weevils had uh, made some theological miscalculation about uh, God's will and uh, thus deserved excommunication. And, you know, this is the, you know, this is right in the middle of the Renaissance and, you know, humanism, you know, where man is the measure of all things is kind of the, the, the standard of the day. And right. St. Vintners aren't about to like coddle a, ba- a bunch of heretical uh, weevils. And so they went to court. And this time, two more advocates were assigned to the, uh, to the weevils. And the weevils said, well, the weevils, through their representation, uh, argued that they, again, had also been created by God and had the right to feed on grass. And for all these and other good reasons, the weevils were in their right uh, when they occupied the vineyards of the commune. And uh, they simply availed themselves of a legitimate privilege conformable to divine and natural law, which is, you know, a pretty good argument. Um, yeah. And the, 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 the plaintiffs retort was that you know the bible and common sense that animals are here for the utility of man and we should uh uh they have no right to cause loss to us and uh, the the council for the insects said that we had no right to command animals uh uh we had the right to command animals but not the right to persecute or excommunicate them which is an interesting subtle argument which means basically you can stomp on them but uh you can't excommunicate them Right. Huh. So the judges were very impressed with the defense arguments, and uh, it was it looked like you know the folks in St. Julian were uh, were headed for another round of uh, you know repentance and <laughs> you know paying their tithes and things like that. Right. Um, but uh, the mayor of St. Julian stepped forward with a uh, a really novel solution to the problem. Uh, he he offered the weevils a deal. <laughs> or, through through the weevils council, he offered the weevils a deal. Right, and uh, he was willing to offer them what was effectively a a weevil preserve, a, a plot of land ceded to them in perpetuity, um, but preserving a right of way uh, for humans across the territory. But otherwise, they could have everything else. Uh, where they could live out the rest of their days in peace and security on the condition that they, the weevils agreed to vacate the vineyards and accept excommunication from the Catholic church. Should they return, which is you know, <laughs> not a terrible idea. <laughs> and, and the, the crack legal team for the weevils accepted the deal. Cause I mean, you can't really pass that up, but uh, the, the legal wrangling didn't actually end there because the one of the weevil advocates uh, Antoine Filio uh, on 1587 declared that he could not in good conscience accept the offer on behalf of the weevils as he had inspected the land set aside for them and found it sterile and unwelcoming mm. ah, so the uh, the lawyer for the the St. Julian uh, said that it's admirably adapted it has a lots of trees shrubs and all sorts of stuff and that the 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 court experts could examine the property and it would be just fine. Now, we don't actually know the results of this trial. Um, we don't know what happened. Uh, there's a set of 29 documents um, with a very long Latin name that I, you know, I don't even want to try to pronounce. Uh, but they're the court records of this, this Weevil trial. So the reason we don't know why is even more suspicious, and that's that the last pages of this, this these twenty nine documents were suspiciously eaten by bugs. <laughs> <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> so essentially, they they the bugs physically annulled the judgment of the court, so we don't know what it was. So it, it when attempts to have the weevils excommunicated failed uh you know they uh they brokered an agreement and then uh 
you know, we had a precarious detente with the, the weevils and the weevils uh, made sure that, uh, that nobody would ever remember the, uh, the results of the trial probably so they could come back in another 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> all right then what what year was this from this uh happened the actual case was in uh the first case was in 1546 the second mm. case i believe was 1587 wow and uh, to this oh. day we don't know uh, whether the weevils are uh are, are planning a comeback or not <laughs> yes yeah, how, how do you work- <laughs> yeah. All right. So you had one other insects in the courtroom, I think. I do indeed. Uh, this is a kind of odd one. Um, oh, un- unlike the last it, one. Oh yeah, the, the other one seems completely normal to me. This one's a little <laughs> odd. <laughs> um, and this one happened in Brazil, and it was a bunch of uh, well, let's. Let me back up. The the Friars Minor of St. Anthony, they're a Franciscan order, right? And they're setting up uh, in the 18th century, opening the 18th century at least, they are uh, they were setting up missions all over Brazil. And in one particular part of Brazil, it's called uh, Pridade no Moranjo, uh, the, uh, they, they were building a monastery. And once the monastery was built, they had ant problems. Um, and they unwisely uh, took those local ants to court for violations of their property rights. And what they didn't expect was that the ants were ready for them. Now, it, one str- particularly strange thing about this is the uh, the order of Saint Francis of Assisi is you know their Saint Francis, Francis himself is generally regarded as patron saint of animals. Uh, mm. And uh, but it turns out a little bit of research uh, Saint. Francis, while he liked anim- uh, animals, really actually disliked ants a lot. Hmm. And there's a, a work by a, a companion of his, an Italian Franciscan monk, uh, where he says the ants were not so pleasing to St. Francis as other living beings because of their great diligence, which seems a little strange to me, in gathering yeah. together and up in the time of summer a treasure of grain for the winter or there's a theological reason for this it's that they weren't placing themselves in the hands of god you know and relying on that they were uh they were storing up and not relying on god's providences which you know, I, I theologically you can find some well theological arguments get funky sometimes but you can sort of see yeah it yeah from. <laughs> so it, that's why it's particularly surprising that uh, this uh, order, which was uh, an order of St. Francis, um, he'd been long dead when the, this trial came up. Uh, so we can't be sure what sort of like a, a amicus curiae would have submitted, but uh, probably would have been against the ants uh, since he didn't like them. But the biggest problem was that uh, the... They dug nice cellars under the foundations to store staple foods like flour of their monastery. And uh, the local ants uh, had discovered that that was pretty tasty. Sure. And sure. they were, the, the local ants are large, numerous. <laughs> and, uh, and in the words of the uh, monks in, during the, the trial, uh, in order to enlarge the limits of their subterranean empire, <laughs> uh, undermine the cellars of the brethren burrowing beneath the foundations and they weaken the walls because they so many of them burrowed underneath and right. uh, carried off the flour uh, which had been kept for you know food for the, the monks um, and the monks uh, were in the peril of famine as a result of this uh, you know you're in the middle of the jungle in the middle of brazil trying to set up a monastery and the ants are stealing your uh, your food you, you get a little you get a little angry and so you said t- <laughs> what do you do you know well you take them to court apparently now the again there are trial records of this and that's i always love it when there are trial records because you find really strange things um and uh it's uh 12 
volumes of transactions of uh, some English society. They translated records from the Nova Floresta, Portuguese uh, history uh, from 1728 that details the trial. Um, if you're Lat Latin or French or Portuguese or up to snuff, you can go read it in the original. But uh, mm. uh, there, there are no, not a lot of English translations. A lot of English translations are... are are, uh, are, are excerpts. Um, right. But the ecclesiastical trial of the Brazilian ants proceeded. And uh, again, you know, these ecclesiastical courts, they, they're fair. They assign counsel to the plaintiffs, the monks, and, and counsel to the defendants, the ants. And the counsel for the plaintiffs I, I argue that the, the jungle was inhospitable. They were gathering supplies for the faithful and the inconvenience of the ants, uh, who they claimed had, uh, whose morals and manner of life were clearly contrary to gospel precepts. And that's a bit of a, a, a reach. Uh, uh, they also said that they uh, lived by fraud and not content with acts of larceny, proceeded to open violence and endeavors to ruin the house. And there's a lot to lay on the ants. Uh, <laughs> Consequently, the uh, prosecution uh, was asking for some sort of divine pestilence or, or more instrumental means of extermination. Uh, basically, uh, they they wanted a good uh, smiting to happen to the right. ants. Um, now, the defense for the ants had a, a fascinating argument, considering that we're talking about uh, 1713. And... That's uh, this particular Franciscan attorney. I don't know if he's an attorney. He's a, in ecclesiastical court. I don't think they call them attorneys. But the, the, the defense, or the equivalent of the Franciscan defense attorney for the ants said, of course, used some of the similar arguments that the, the, the Weevil uh, defen uh, uh, counsel used and that they, uh, the, as ants were endowed, with life, they were compelled to preserve said life with the instincts implanted in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ants in their displeasing behavior were actually displaying some rather admirable qualities, prudence, diligence, and charity in aiding each other, which were all cardinal virtues. So he's basically <laughs> <laughs> being really obnoxious, this, this defense. Uh, and he said, given the comparative size of an ant versus a monk, their burdens often far surpass that of the, the monks. So he said, hey, these ants are working harder than you are. <laughs> and <laughs> the, the most fascinating argument this guy had, remembering that it's 1713 and, you know, Europe is busy colonizing the whole new world, you know, just as fast as they can. He, one of his arguments was his clients, the ants, had been in possession of the land long before the appellants. <laughs> and mm. established themselves there and that seizure of said territory was by simple force on the part of the Franciscans and conducted that while it might be justifiable that the plaintiffs defend their monastery by human means, that means the monks, you know, crush the ants as they see them, right. Uh, right. That, that an appeal for retribution from the creator was wholly unjustifiable. <laughs> so this, this went to the judge. And the judge said uh, that the brethren should appoint a field in their neighborhood. Again, we got a very similar to, it looks like these guys read maybe some of the Weevil case law. And right, uh, right. they should appoint a field in their neighborhood suitable for the habitation of the ants and that the latter should change their abode immediately under pain of major excommunication. <laughs> 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 and that way both, you know, the, the ants would have their own field and the, uh, uh, the, the monks would not have to worry about their, uh, their food anymore or their right. house being undermined by burrowing ants, which and apparently ants in Brazil are really big and nasty. And I, I can imagine them burrowing under a, <laughs> a wall and, uh, and undermining it. Uh, a yeah. friar was, uh, a, <laughs> a friar was, uh, appointed to uh, convey this uh, to the insects. And he did it by uh, reading it aloud, this judgment aloud at the uh, openings of their burrows. Uh, <laughs> and we're, we're never uh, told whether the ants accepted the, uh, the, the arbitration terms, but uh, one suspects they uh, continued their fight against the, 
Portuguese colonial expansion. And you, you got to just you just got to marvel at stuff like that, where it's like, yeah, we'll just hold the animals to our our created laws. Well, you know, and sometimes I, I, they, sometimes we see too much of ourselves in them. There's a, a famous quote. Uh, from uh, Lewis Thomas, he's a, a entomologist and it's oddly also a, a poet. <laughs> he said, uh, "Ants are so much like human beings as to be an embarrassment. They farm fungi, raise aphids as livestock, launch armies into wars, use chemical sprays to alarm and confuse enemies, and capture slaves. The families of weaver ants engage in child labor, holding their larvae like shuttles to spin out the thread that sews the leaves together for their fungus gardens. They exchange information ce- ceaselessly. They do everything but watch television." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. (laughs) Wow. Um, All right. Tell people where they can find more of your stuff. More of my stuff can be found on my website, esoterics.com, E-S-O-T-E-R-X.com. I'm also on Tumblr, same, E-S-O-T-E-R-X, dot Tumblr.com. And I can be found on Twitter at Esoterics. (laughs) And you are not on Facebook. I am not on Facebook. I have only so many hours in the day. (laughs) Fair enough. All right. Thank you so much, Aaron. Oh, thank you. All right, and there you go. Go check out Aaron at his website, esoterics.com. We'll have him back again, I'm sure, sometime relatively soon. And as I said, there was an extra segment for Patreons, about 15 minutes long, about him telling one more story. So if you're a patron, you got that as well as uh, both parts right away so you didn't have to wait a week. And there you go. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.